first uh, speaker is uh, Dr. Mark Mile. Um, he's out of Tampa, Florida. He's a board certified uh, American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. Uh, he serves as a, a national board exam examiner, specialized in the treatment of injuries and disorders of the shoulder and elbow, uh, having been trained in an uh, ASES fellowship. And now he, he returns that favor training um, fellows uh, every year. We actually sent three of our fellows down, including Dr. Givens, um, uh, down to Tampa a couple years ago. It was, it was just a fantastic uh, opportunity. Um, he uses advanced surgical techniques and is always looking to innovate uh, as he goes forward. He's one of the um, uh, country's best when it comes particularly to even like difficult cases and fracture work. And uh, he's going to talk a little bit today about arthroplasty considerations in the active patient. So without further ado, Dr. Mark Mao. So it's always nice, and I, I don't know if this is turned on so I, I can walk around and everybody can hear me. So I, I kind of get a lay of the land first, and I want to say Dr. Krupp, outstanding, humble, uh, just a superhuman being, and I've had the privilege of knowing him for quite a while. And he does just tremendous work. He's really well known, well published. So thank you, Dr. Krupp, for that introduction. Um, physical therapist, hands up. How many? I just got to get a. Okay, we got a lot of therapy folks here. Okay, so uh, you know one of the things. So I want to kind of make it so it's kind of geared towards everybody who's at this meeting. Um, you know, I think we have to take life as a, a team experience. Marriage. Team experience, either I got the kids, she got the kids, now they're grown up, but we work together. In the healthcare industry, if I do a surgery and you don't do therapy or my rep doesn't bring me the implant or my surgical tech is hung over from a Friday night, it could be a bad experience. So we need to work together because what is the goal is really patient outcome. And that's not the surgeon, that's not the therapist, that's not the rep, that's not the engineer, but it's everybody working together. So while people are eating their lunch, and I turned my cell phone off because the last time I went to one of these, my cell phone went off when I was on the podium, which is always quite embarrassing, especially when you're the speaker. Um, but, you know, we all are connected with texting and messaging and everything. I've already got like five phone calls today from therapist, surgical center, patients, you know, what do I do? So I want to kind of give you a story first, just kind of break the ice. Um, everybody knows Benjamin Franklin, I think. Uh, so Benjamin Franklin said, never talk about money, politics, and religion. So I'm going to break down and talk about politics, and uh, maybe I'll get through it. No. So there's also myth in politics. So this is kind of more historical, kind of, you know, why do, we, do you wear special socks when you play baseball? Do you have your lucky OR skull cap when you do surgery? If you're a therapist, do you have your special shoes that you wear that give you that increased activity level? So there is a curse of Tippecanoe. Has anyone ever heard of that before? Not many people. So the curse of Tippecanoe. So Tecumseh was an Indian chief. There's no test after this. He lived in Ohio. And the Indians just didn't like the expansion out west. So in 1811, you know, Henry Harrison goes to fight the Indians. And he wins. And it's, you know, a big victory for America. You know, we're doing great. But Tecumseh's brother put a curse the 20-year curse. And anyone who was a president in the years of 1840 on up, every 20 years, would die in office. Now, just so you know, eight presidents have died in office. Seven have died in the years that end in 20. So Harrison becomes president in 1840. One month later, he dies of pneumonia, dead. 1860, Abraham Lincoln, Civil War, end of the war, he goes to the theater. His actual Secret Service agent went to get a beer across the street, true, and Lincoln gets assassinated. 1880, William Garfield, one of the larger presidents, is on a railroad track in early July, and a kind of a rabble rouser who wanted to be Secretary of State assassinates him on the rail station. He dies three or four months later from the wounds. Then we get to year 2000, McKinley. McKinley is famous, Mount McKinley in Alaska, you know, President of the United States, he goes to Buffalo to a music festival, he gets shot. Pretty ominous now. Do you want to be elected in a year and it ends in 20? 1920, Harding. Harding dies in office. 1940, Roosevelt, cerebral hemorrhage. 1960, John F. Kennedy, shot in Dallas. Then it kind of gets a little murky, so that's where the people who are in Ripley's Believe It or Not and other things are, well, this isn't really holding true, but really, 1980, Reagan did get shot. He just didn't die. 
but he was shot, and, he could, and if it wasn't for the Secret Service agent that jumped in front of him, the one that would have been at the bar back in 1860, he would have died. 2000, George Bush becomes president, and he survived. He was on the podium in Georgia, the province of Russia, not Georgia down south, close to where I am, but someone throws a hand grenade at George Bush, but it was wrapped in a handkerchief, and it kept it from deploying, so he lived. So 2020, Biden is elected president. Now, he has nothing has happened to Joe Biden yet, but if he does get reelected, you know, the water gets murky again. So is this a curse or is this just one of those kind of happenstance things that occurs, uh, you know, in life? So let's get to my talk now. So I think in my talk, I wanted to get to kind of where we were and where we're going in shoulder arthroplasty. So you have a really good city for medicine. I just drove by the health complexes, I was surprised, I mean, it's just amazing. They're all kind of put together in downtown. And so, you know, you deliver a great level of care and we're, we're getting better. So as a older orthopedic surgeon, I hate saying that, I turned 60 this year, but I think back about where we came from and where we're going and the future and the technology and things that are coming down the pike that is gonna make, you know, medicine even better. So if I go back to outcomes, total shoulder arthroplasty, well done, by an experienced surgeon, still gives you probably the best outcome for a joint replacement for the shoulder. Now there's the reverse shoulder arthroplasty, which is gaining incredible popularity, and you probably as therapists have to work with that. It doesn't uh, involve as much balancing the shoulder to make it work, but still, when we look at overall outcomes, if you do a well done total shoulder, it performs better. But why don't we always do that, and when do we decide, and there are a lot of questions. If you go back historically, Think about this, this is a French uh, bicycle maker who crafted this shoulder replacement that some poor patient with tuberculosis got put in. I can't imagine that going back in at the turn of the last century, but it did. Um, you know, and these are kind of some of the designs that have been out there. And I know Dr. Krupp is looking at this and saying that one looks way overstuffed or you know, that's a metal back glenoid, why don't we use that? But we keep trying to get technology that will make the shoulder replacement lasts longer. So if you take a regular anatomic total shoulder in a patient over 65, that does great. But now we've got the 50-year-old you know, weightlifter, the rugby player, people who work out a lot, and you go to them, well, I really don't want you lifting weights after I replace your shoulder, and they kind of have a blank look in their eye, and they're looking back at you. So we're trying to figure out kind of what materials, what implants, what techniques can we do to allow for younger, more active patients to have arthroplasty. What's a modern day shoulder? It's an all polyglenoid press fit, um, you know, kind of uh, stem. And uh, we want to kind of create, recreate the perfect circle. We want to kind of restore the anatomy as it was. Um, you know, it's never going to be perfect. It's an artificial joint. So I, I always kind of get interested when we have all these discussions in orthopedics about restoring the anatomy, but we're restoring the anatomy of a joint that's arthritic and deformed. So we want to get close. We want to get the rotator cuff length uh, tension curves back. We want to get things working. And there are a lot of options for patients. You know, we've looked at just doing a hemi, a half a joint. Technically, it's a little easier. You don't have to do the glenoid. It doesn't require as much surgery. But the material that we have historically used is cobalt chrome, which is hard. It's metal. So it bears into the glenoid, and it causes it to erode. So when you start to look the head-to-head -head studies looking at hemis versus total shoulders, well, you know, you see that there's this 20% failure rate. Well, in a lot of other, in, in hip and knee, they wouldn't accept the 20% failure rate in that, in that kind of arena. In the shoulder world, it's like, oh yeah, 20% failure rate, that, well, it works for 80%, so you know, we're doing it, but it's still not what we wanna see. So I think we're a little bit behind our colleagues who do hip and knee when it comes to deciding what to do for patients. Then we look at total shoulder arthroplasty, and basically, it is a great operation, but when you do it in younger patients, and you can look at the numbers there, again, 20% failure rate or reoperation from component failure. Because you take a 52 year old who likes to bench press 250 pounds and you put a shoulder replacement in him and guess what? It doesn't work. So it does have a lot to do with patient expectations. And when you look at the difference between the two, I would still say total shoulder historically has outperformed hemi. But why? Because the material was bad. So on a hemi you have cobalt chrome which is hard. So let's kind of jump to the future. And it's not really the future. Pyrocarbon is a new material that's available for shoulder arthroplasty. It has the same, and this is kind of an engineering term, modulus of elasticity, almost, 
as the glenoid bone. So it doesn't bore into it, it doesn't lead to the early failure, it doesn't cause as much pain. And it came out of the nuclear industry. They were, they were figuring out how to moderate neutrons. I had to look that up. That's a non-charged atomic particle. So I didn't know that, but I'm just telling you guys, that's what it is. So, but this has kind of evolved over a timeline till we came with small joints and finally to doing shoulder implants. The one around 2000 is a snooker ball. So in France, they started just taking what would be like a, a eight ball from a pool table, stuck it in the shoulder, and the French surgeon says, this does well. But I don't know. I mean, but that's what they did. So then they started using these pyrocarbon hemis. And you know, there's a very famous uh, French surgeon, Pascal Below. He doesn't even do the glenoid anymore. He puts pyrocarbon hemiarthroplasty in everybody. And he does it in weightlifters and rugby players and all his athletes because he feels that because it doesn't bore into the bone, you don't have to do as big of an operation, gets people back to weightlifting and playing rugby and doing more aggressive sports. The manufacture is difficult. You have to heat something up to 1400 degrees, which is incredibly hot to manufacture this material. And it doesn't bear into the bone. The studies have shown that it is much better. In fact, most of our studies, it's like two times better, three times better, 30 times better in terms of boring into the bone. Now, that doesn't happen very often in medical studies. So why are we still using metal on the glenoid? You know, and the technique is what we've been doing forever, and, and it's easy to do. So I have. Um, you know, a 53-year-old, we always give them nice name. This guy gets in a cherry picker and cuts palm fronds. That's what an arborist is in Florida, but that's what he does. And he, ha he works out all the time, and he didn't want something that was going to be, you know, he was going to have to modify his activities or not do heavy activities. You know, so we went ahead and this guy, and we did a, you know, pre-op. We get the studies. You know, we'll go ahead. We'll look at the, at the CT. And I pretty much get a CAT scan that allows for planning. So that's something that's new. When I first started out, it was kind of like thumb up, draw some things on an x-ray. Now we've got the ability to do 3D planning. So you know you can kind of plan out exactly what you're going to put in the shoulder. So you can figure out the exact size of the head you want to use, the exact size of the implant. You know What are we doing? And so it saves time in the art because your reps can just bring the box. It used to bring, you bring a box for everything. There'd be like 30 different boxes in the back of the room. But you kind of have an idea what you're going to use. And when you actually get everything open, I mean, this is back to brass tacks. We're using a regular reciprocating saw or oscillating saw, taking the head off, and we're going to go ahead and prepare the bone. So you make your head cut, and then you're down to the metaphyseal bone. You're going to put your stem in. But what's kind of interesting is, and it looks really cool. I mean, I have to say, putting in a black head, and the final implant is also black like the trial. But you kind of get your right size. And you want to downsize, because to manufacture this requires a little bit of a stem that you put in. And then the other thing about pyrocarbon is we used to take a mallet and hammer on the cobalt chrome. But you can't hit pyrocarbon, because you could theoretically cause some imperfection or crack. Also, you can't have metal on the other side of the glenoids. If someone had an operation, and they've got a screw or an anchor, and the pyrocarbon hits it, it's going to disrupt the pyrocarbon surface. So you don't want that either. So we get a nice view. You know, we want to see the socket. We want to do our releases. And you know, then we're going to put in the stem. And it's got this nice uh, coating that the bone grows into. That takes about three months. Uh, there's a rod that lines up with the form to make sure we've got the version just right. And we take that right down. And once we get that into place, then comes the cool part. Here's where you're going to kind of take the final head that you've sized for. And what I always tell anyone who's doing this, if it's a surgeon, drop down a size. Because if you put in what you normally would, it will end up being a little bit too thick. So we've got everything in place. We've got our sutures for repair. And you can see that the pyrocarbon is deposited. It's graphite. It's a kind of graphite with more covalent bonds. But it's placed onto the trunnion. And then there's this Teflon impactor that you have to snap three times. I feel like I'm in like some kind of movie, but you're snapping that thing to get it down. I didn't trust it, so I snapped it another couple times because I'm like, I want to make sure that thing's on. So this is kind of uh, another case, 37. You know, and we hate to do arthroplasties in people who are like, unfortunately, my daughter's age now as I get a little older, but you know, so that are 37 years old. We don't want to do that, but you get certain disease conditions where you have, and it doesn't look that bad on the x-ray, but here's what's interesting about avascular necrosis. The bone just dies, and it dies, and the cartilage falls off. And so you know, this is another example where you can use pyrocarbon, 37-year-old patient. I don't want to have something that's going to fail that soon. Hopefully, that'll last 20 or 30 years. Here's, this is not my case, because this is going to show what, what happens long-term. Bad accident, you know, 35-year-old, BMX, you know, 
and it's like terrible looking glenoid. Go in, do the case. In this case, there's a little bit, the, the, the socket isn't like a golf tee. It's kind of the ball's falling out the back. So we want to kind of smooth it and create a better cup so that the ball will sit in there. So we create that cup, you know, and so we end up doing the surgery where we're burring down, smoothing and contouring. It's not a true, what, there's a guy named Matson in Washington State that go about ream and run, but this is just, you want to get rid of the ridge in the middle. Just, you can imagine kind of making a nice little bowl for the ball to sit in. And so once you've done that, you kind of put the head on and the final x-ray looks something like this. But what's interesting is that if you kind of follow things along, you know, you follow things along to a year, you keep following things along, now we're getting further along. And, you know, at five years, you know, this is still functioning well. But if you kind of, and I went through pretty quick, but the cartilage didn't change. So you're not losing cartilage like you would historically by using a cobalt chrome or a metal implant by putting that in there. And remember the picture in the beginning? This poor guy who couldn't rotate his arm. And to the credit of the therapist, that's a lot of therapy involved there, a lot of time. And you know, the only thing that always kind of is, is interesting to me, I don't know if Ryan or, or, or Justin have the same feeling. You know, we start therapy if you cut the muscle. So why do we hold up therapy? Why do surgeons stop therapy? If I take down the subscap, and sew it back, it takes about six to 12 weeks for tendon healing. So then the patient usually shows up around six weeks to do physical therapy to re rehabilitate their shoulder. And the biggest concern in doing an anatomic total shoulder is that muscle doesn't heal. And so that it pulls off. In fact, when we look at reverse shoulders where we've cut the muscle and sew it back, the failure rate is 50% that the muscle doesn't heal. Now with the reverse, it doesn't matter because we don't rely on the subscap with the reverse for stability. But with an anatomic total shoulder, if the subscap fails, the operation fails. And we understand from our literature that probably one out of 20 fails. Now, it doesn't always mean another surgery, but it's a pretty high failure rate. The other thing is that, like, usually when I really want my patients to get therapy, when they're kind of starting to lift and get better condition again, like we had the lecture about preventive medicine, the other things I thought was fabulous. I really want it like six months because then they can start doing all of those evolutions that I saw in the lectures from this morning. And then what happens in America is you run out of therapy at about the time they really need therapy, in my opinion, <laughs> and then they don't get it. So, you know, the other thing about therapists is that they're always in shape across the board. If I took 20 orthopedic surgeons, there'd be a couple really heavy ones, a couple that probably were taking too many uh, cigarettes and, you know, but they're not a healthy group. But therapists always seem to be healthy, and my patients love my therapist. Christina Pando runs our therapy department at Florida Orthopedic, we're in the office I work at. But you see the patients more than we do. And so you develop a bond with them that sometimes we don't have that same bond. So in summary for pyrocarbon, the biggest thing for surgeons is don't put in too big of a ball. So don't overstuff because that leads to failure, and that's from the French experience. And don't do it if there's metal on the glenoid or the socket side, because the metal, it's like putting a spike in a tree with a chainsaw. It's going to cause a problem. No metal on the glenoid side if you're going to do this. All right? So, you know, when we look at what's going on in America, results are very promising. It's doing just as well as total shoulders with pyrocarbon hemiarthroplasty. And, you know, some of the other studies are showing two-year data in America. So this is European data is probably around 10 years. In the U.S., it's about two-year data. But... I always find it fascinating that something that was like coating the inside of a nuclear reactor ends up, you know, as a shoulder arthroplasty option someday. Like, how does this all start, you know? And uh, who figures this out and who decides, hey, you know that pyrocarbon stuff, why don't we, you know? So, you, you know, some people are just super clever and hopefully you meet a lot of them in your lifetime. So I want to talk about the subscapularis as the second part of this thought, talk. So. My own personal story is I tore my Achilles trying to play basketball with high school kids about five years ago. And you may question my judgment, but that's not why we're talking about this. Um, so I went out for a rebound, came down, and I was like, one of these kids kicked me. You know, I'm like, who kicked me? And, you know, the downside is I elected against surgery for that because I had six cases to do two days later, and I put my, myself in a boot. I did the... Uh, whether it works or not with the PRP injections. I got an uh, MRI scan to make sure the tendon heads were. And three months later, I was pretty well healed. Now, the downside, I don't know who here has, who has had a boot on the right foot for a fracture or anything else? Has anyone had that? Not many? 
how do you drive a car with a boot on your right foot? So my fellows, not Dr. Divens, but my historical fellows would drive me to work every day. It was like driving Miss Daisy. I would get a ride to work. This was wonderful. But you know, it was so terrible to be immobilized, right? So then I started thinking, why am I doing shoulder arthroplasty and taking down the subscapularis and having to put someone in a shoulder immobilizer for six weeks? This sounds kind of cruel, like who wants that, right? You, you're kind of stuck here, you're not supposed to drive, you know, you can't reach up in the, sh so I, I read a bunch of articles, kind of, you know, historical articles, and then I went to see a guy in Alabama, actually, believe it or not, this guy Dave Atkinson was doing subscap sparing, I watched him, and then I did about 50, now I have the luxury of having a cadaver lab near my office, which most people don't have, but during, you know, this kind of time period, I started practicing trying to not take the muscle down, thinking that this was pretty cool. And I saw him do it, and I said, well, it's got to be possible. And they've done it in France. You know, the French are always leading the charge when it comes to shoulders. Laurent Lafosse did it. So, you know, when you look at it, there's, there's a pretty high incidence of failure. Um, you have to pre protect the repair. Six weeks of immobilization, return to work. Like, you know, so I've done now this operation on about five orthopedic surgeons, and they could go back and do joint replacement at three weeks, I had a guy do two total hips and a total knee, um, you know, so you can go back sooner because you didn't take down the muscle. So I'm like, well, this, this makes a lot of sense to me, but it's not easy. There's not a lot of instruments, and it's not like I can call, you know, Dr. Sigmund and say, hey, how do you do this? Because there's not a lot of other people doing it. So you're kind of learning along the way, and so um, I think the cadaver lab was really helpful. You got to plan everything. And one, one thing I've realized as I've gotten older is that I'm not as good as I thought I was, and I hate saying that, but when you look at planning and you're looking at um, you know, cost savings, you're looking at efficiency, you're looking at better understanding of anatomy, you kind of start to understand that the 3D anatomy is much better than a two-dimensional or an X-ray, and you can spin things in the three-dimensional world. You can bring AI into it to give you some help in understanding that. And I thought this is a cool slide. In simple terms, if you ask me to go up to that wall and put a pin perpendicular to the wall, I can be off uh, probably up to about 10 degrees. I might think I'm, per and so when you're putting something in a socket and you're doing it yourself, you know, it can be off, you know, up to 10 degrees. Now in the future, if a robot puts that pin in, it's off one degree. So why robotics? Why change the future? Why do we go in that direction? But even a very, very good surgeon has trouble putting components in exactly like they even template it, because you have to execute what you templated. So I think robotics is going to be kind of one of the things coming down the pike, and it's coming. Um, they have now templates with the Zimmer Biman has a template thing, but Stryker will have the robot coming down the pike, which kind of assists in doing surgery. I think I'm not supposed to say robot, but um, you know, let me, let me just show a couple examples here. So this is a, just a planning, why do I plan and why do I keep the subscap? 29-year-old female. She was a police officer, um, rheumatoid arthritis, destroyed all of her joints. By the time I saw her, she had two hips already done, and both of her shoulders were terrible. She wanted to have children. She married a guy who was six foot eight, a football player, probably looked like uh, you know, some guy who came off the uh, Kentucky football team, and um, her shoulders were killing her. So we get this, and we have to plan it out. Now, I hate doing arthroplasty in 29-year-olds. Why? When it goes well, it's 95, and I tell everyone that in the office, 95% success rate. But 5% of the time, it fails. So now I take this young lady in the front, or this young lady, or this young lady, and we've got a failure that she's got an infection, she needs six weeks of IV antibiotics. You know, that's life changing. So when it works, we're heroes, but I spend more time on my driveway thinking about when it didn't work than when it did work. So that's one thing you have to consider when you're doing these tough cases. But we can plan this. So I'm going to know exactly what I'm doing, what my moves are going to be. And it's kind of like when my daughter used to do gymnastics, she would sit and kind of meditate before the meet. I can kind of look through this and get an idea of what I'm going to do. So I'm planning everything out so I know exactly what size implants, where the bone's coming off, kind of where I need to place things into the bone. This is a base plate that's going in. So that goes onto the bone. It's like a wall mount. I'm going to secure it with a bunch of, of cobalt chrome or titanium screws. You know, to the bone, you can plan out where those screws go. And then finally, you put the ball. So it's a Morris taper, but the ball in most of these is made of cobalt chrome when you put the final ball on. You can take everything off and look where you removed your bone. You can kind of spin around and see where the defects in the bone might be. And remember, 
Rheumatoid is a destructive disease that in general takes away bone. It is erosive, it causes the socket to get worn in. It's very, very bad. And so I can then also plan on my, my humerus side where I'm gonna put the socket. And finally, I can get a sense of my range of motion is gonna be after the surgery. So she got that, she's had both of her shoulders done now. Now she came back to me last week for her elbow. Like I said, I think rheumatoid is one of the most horrible diseases that even though we have all these new drugs that you see on TV, Embryl, Remicade, everything, it's still bad. And when young people get it, it really changes their lives. Um, here's a 57-year-old end-stage arthritis. Uh, you know, he has some comorbidities. You can see his x-rays. And I, and I go back to the blueprint. But you can see where the ossifrites are. So I can kind of think to myself, I'm like, where do I chisel off the bone? Where do I smooth things down? Where is my socket going to go? In the future, the robot will help me do this. But for now, I'm still doing it on my own. But in this case, I did not take down the muscle, nor did I on that rheumatoid female. I kept her remnant of her subscap intact. So what does that mean for her, who has this busy life? Two weeks in a sling just for the swelling, and she can take the sling off. This gentleman, too. It's going to be just two weeks in a sling. And then I can send them to the therapist at three and four weeks instead of at six weeks. And what I've developed is, and, and, and you know, I always laugh because Mark Frankel, and I, I was Mark Frankel's fellow, but he gave me the 10 Habits of Highly Successful People. I don't know, even know if people read that anymore, but he's like, you've got to read this. It's going to help you a lot. So I kind of made things into steps. So how can I reproducibly do this operation in seven steps, right? And so, you know, first I kind of start off by making a superior window, do things I normally do. So, uh, you know, I'm kind of working and I'm de developing the spaces. Because now you're not taking down the muscle, so I'm kind of coming over the top. So you, the front of the shoulder is, uh, I don't know from where you're looking, probably to the left of the screen, but you're kind of coming in from the front. And then I'm going to make this inferior window. I'm going to go underneath the subscap with a bone chisel, and I'm going to take off the ossified. This is a tricky part because if you you, you got to have the os osteotome go into the head. Like you, you don't want to hurt a nerve or artery or any kind of vessel, so you kind of got to do this part. And then, you know, you're cleaning up. But I have not taken down any muscles at this point. I'm exploiting the rotator interval. I'm kind of working through the gaps to try to get down to where I need to be. Now I have to cut the head. So we designed, I've got a bunch of engineers at work uh, at our, our lab. And so they helped me design a special cutting block. Um, I can do this intermedullary. So I know if I put uh, intermedullary guide as opposed to an external guide, it's much more precise. So we want to have our cut as precise as we can. So we're going to go intermedullary first. And that's just a reamer that goes right down in the marrow space. Everyone always asks me, like, why are you doing to my marrow space? I said, at that point in your life, it's just fatty marrow. There's, like, not much in your marrow space. There's not much going on. Um, but people get worried about it because they see that metal thing in there. But this is a special jig that we have that we've designed. And a jig just allows your saw to come over the top so you can cut the bone. I also use a saw that just cuts at the tip because some of the other saws spray too much and you could damage soft tissues. But this just allows your, your saw blade to come down. And we're just cutting off the disease articular margin. And then I finish it with an osteotome. But you can see how pitted, corroded, how awful. Like arthritis, by the grace of God, it doesn't run in my family. But like my wife's, it does. But it looks awful to me when you have arthritis. Like that must really be painful. So it's a kind of a dance because you know, I went to China. And I said, you, know, you don't want to create a Chinese finger trap. And the Chinese guy looks at me and goes, what's that? They don't call it a Chinese figure trap, no duh, but I mean, I kind of learned that the hard way. But the more retractors you put in a shoulder, the tighter it is. So when I'm teaching people, I'm working with people, less is more. If I can do something with just one retractor, that's better. So we try to put in as few as possible while we get the maximal exposure for the joint. So here we're going to put in the stem. So the stem gets pounded in. I'm going to use the stem as a chalk block just to kind of plane off that to get my cut just the way I want it to be. You know, and so sometimes you can kind of do a little fine tuning, which is why I like stems and not stemless, because if I do a stemless shoulder, if I get my cut wrong, I put my stemless component in wrong. If I put a brooch in first with a stemmed component, I can get it exactly flat. And my partner, Mark Frankel, is going back and going to have a big paper on why stemless shoulders are bad, because uh, everybody for the last five years has been saying why stemless shoulders are good. So this is kind of the exposure you can get without taking the muscle down, seeing right into the socket to kind of do your uh, joint replacement. So I'm kind of doing the final touches there. And then I'm going to bring in the reamers, because you know, 
we have to ream. Now, in the future, if you have smart tools or different kind of things to do this, that's a big thing to stick in the shoulder. I'd much rather use a smaller burr or like a fine brush or something to kind of paint and clear off the re residual cartilage. And then we put in our plastic component. So we still use metal on plastic. And I've heard more concerns from patients in the past couple of years about metal on metal, metal allergies, nickel allergies, cobalt allergies. You know, they come all the time. So we'll drill out the pegs to put this in, and then we'll put in our all you know polyethylene cemented plastic socket. You want a nice firm base to have that sitting on. Now, as therapists, the good news is this patient, because I didn't cut any muscles, you can advance a little quicker. You're not going to damage anything, you know. So you don't have to worry. Like, are we externally rotating too far? Are we? No, you don't have to worry about that. In fact, I tell people, look, you have a sling to keep the swelling down, but if you want to take it off to go drive your car or go out to dinner, do it. Um, you know, the main thing I've noticed is that it's still a joint replacement. They still swell a lot. So it, despite not cutting the muscle, you still have all that post-surgical swelling. And you don't want to start moving too soon because you don't want a post-operative wound infection or something of that nature. So there's a plastic socket in. We've got our final kind of exposures using all our retractors. We'll put our final stem in. And I remember when I was a kid, I had this little plastic thing my grandma used to throw coins in, you know, that would open. So I figured if I put sutures on either side and pull it apart, it would help me get the head in a little easier, which it did. Thank you, Grandma. So I'm kind of doing this. But a lot of these things that I do doing this kind of I learned along the journey because I didn't have anyone to call or ask. But now Dr. Givens is doing this. I think Dr. Krupp is doing this. I've got former fellows doing this that are in uh, Texas, so I've, it's catching on. And so, you know, I have people, and I don't like it, I have people that fly into town to get their shoulder replacement, but the hard part there is if you have a post-op problem, 5%, now you got someone in Arizona. And I really don't like that. But it's been a really great journey. It's been fun. And, you know, at the end of the case, instead of having to do a big repair, you just put two stitches in the interval and you're done. So I thank everybody for their attention. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, to all you therapists, keep doing a great job. And, uh, you know, uh, I... I have a fond relationship with Christina because of my Achilles tendon rupture. We spent a lot of time talking about life. So I, I, what you guys do is great. Thank you.